It was in 1936 that General Manstein's support vehicle, which better known as the assault gun, became one of the most important German armoured fighting vehicles of the Second World War. Five prototypes employing the Panzer 3B chassis were built in 1937, before the firm of Alket of Berlin began full production of the Model A in January 1940. Subsequent four marks, B through to E, while incorporating many improvements, nevertheless retained essentially the same appearance, until the advent of the Model F8 with its longer gun and improved hull design in September 1942. Just 24 assault guns were in service at the time of the invasion of France and the Low Countries in May 1940, serving in four batteries number 640, 659, 660 and 665 respectively. Their success in their intended role of infantry support was, however, out of all proportion to the small numbers actually employed. In April, Sturm Battery 640 had been allocated to the elite infantry regiment Gross Deutschland and redesignated the 16th Company, which saw service with Guderian's 19th Panzer Corps. Although official wisdom in 1940 stated that assault guns were not to be employed in an anti-tank role, force of circumstance meant that Stug crews ended up using their charges for exactly that purpose, demonstrating in the process an ability to kill tanks that would soon become the type's forte. When exactly one year after the French surrender, Hitler unleashed his legions against the Soviet Union, the Sturm artillery had undergone both a significant expansion and a change in organization. Assault guns were now organized into battalions, with each fielding three batteries of six Stugs. For Barbarossa, six battalions deploying approximately 108 assault guns were distributed between army groups north, center, and south where all were involved in very heavy fighting from the opening day of the campaign. While it was intended that the assault guns would serve in their primary role as infantry support, the sheer quantity of armour thrown at the advancing German columns by the Red Army in a bid to halt their headlong eastward advance inevitably found the Stug battalions increasingly employed in an anti-tank role, even if just to protect the infantry they were tasked to support. In the main, this did not prove problematic for the Stug detachments, the plethora of light and medium tank types fielded by the Soviets being decidedly obsolescent, their thin armour being easily penetrated by the assault gun's main armament. But dealing with the new T-34, KV-1 and KV-2 and their thick armour was another matter, the Stug III sharing exactly the same problem vis-à-vis -vis these new designs as the Panzer Mark IV. Both German designs were equipped with the same low-velocity 75mm L24 cannon optimised for the close support role firing high-explosive shells. Indeed, of the 44 rounds normally carried by the Stug, over 80% were high-explosive, with just a token number being armour-piercing. Even when the AP ammunition was used, the low muzzle velocity of the main gun did not always impart sufficient energy to allow it to penetrate the thick armour of the new Russian tanks. And yet Stugs did succeed in killing these new Soviet monsters in spite of this apparent technological limitation. Other factors came into play by way of compensation. Above all was the technical proficiency of the Stug crews themselves. Training had honed their skill to combine the mobility of the Stug with accurate and rapid gunnery by getting in the first shot and exploiting to the full the machine's inherent advantages such as its low profile and relatively heavy frontal armour. Even when taking on a T-34, the accumulation of these factors often allowed the Stug crew to close within the gun range of the Soviet tank and take it out before it could react. This was particularly true in the opening months of the campaign, as many of the Soviet crews were very unsure of their new charges and completely without the sort of command and control procedures that governed the operations of German mobile forces. It was in the summer of 1941 that the assault gun battalions began a tally of Soviet armor that would claim 20,000 tanks destroyed by 1944. As the German armies pushed deeper into Russia, the assault gun battalions were constantly in action as the panzer divisions encircled large numbers of Soviet forces in great pockets, which were reduced by infantry and artillery. The assault artillery found themselves frequently employed as fire brigades, being shifted from one sector of a pocket to another, as Soviet forces within made desperate attempts to break out to the east. Quite often this meant firing at point-blank range into whole bodies of Soviet infantry, making a do-or-death charge at the German lines. The greatest of these cauldron battles was that of Kiev, 
where eventually some 665,000 Soviet prisoners were taken. After that battle, the forces of Army Group South pushed further eastwards. The drive by von Reichenau's 6th Army towards Kharkov was designed to capture the Soviet Union's fourth largest city and one of its major industrial centers. The Kharkov Tractor Works was, for example, one of the major tank producers in the Soviet Union at this time. It was in mid-October when the Germans closed in on the city. Heavy artillery pounded Soviet defensive positions on the outskirts of the city as infantry worked their way slowly forward to take them. Thereafter, they pushed in towards the center of Kharkov. Assault guns were brought forward to fire on Soviet positions in buildings around the center, with covering fire being given by machine gunners in attached command half-tracks. The fighting for Kharkov was fierce, and it did not finally fall until the 24th of October. Deliveries of replacement assault guns were sent to the nearest station in operation to the front. These two Stugs are Mark Ds. 90716 still retains its chassis number on the hull front, where it was chalked on before leaving the Alcat factory in Berlin. At the end of September 1941, the Germans launched Operation Typhoon, the last great offensive to take Moscow before the onset of winter. Soviet defences before the capital were cracked by panzer thrusts encircling the Red Army forces in the twin battles of Vyazma and Bryansk. Once again, the assault gun battalions found themselves supporting infantry to hold the line of the pocket and prevent desperate Russians from breaking out. Some 663,000 Soviet prisoners were taken, but Moscow did not fall. The onset of the Great Cold and the Soviet counter-offensive found the Germans ill-prepared to cope with the worst winter in Russia for 50 years. Stug crews had to learn new disciplines to keep their engine oil from freezing, the grease on their gun mechanisms from congealing, their sighting mechanisms from frosting up. In short, keeping a Stug in condition to fight was a miracle when temperatures could fall to minus 30 degrees and lower. Nevertheless, the assault gun units continued to inflict heavy casualties on Soviet armor, as witnessed by the burnt-out hulks of KV-1s and T-34 seen in this footage. With the approach of spring in 1942, the Germans had weathered the Soviet storm and now looked forward to the resumption of offensive operations so as to bring the war in the East to a successful conclusion. In 1942, the organization of assault gun battalions was changed yet again, with the number of Stugs in each battery being raised from six to nine. Each battery was now composed of three sections of three Stugs. With a strength of 27 assault guns, each battalion was now much more powerful than just a year before. Further changes came with the addition of a command Stug to each battery. By the end of 1942, each battery could now field 30 assault guns. Hitler had demanded that the armor and the armament of the assault gun be upgraded to deal with the T-34 and KV tanks, but it was not until March 1942 that the Stug Model F appeared, mounting the long 75mm Sturm Cannon 40, initially of 43 calibers, but increased thereafter to 48 calibers. First footage of the Stug 3F came with the parade of the re-equipped 1st SS Division Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler in Paris on July 29, 1942, the salute being taken by Feld Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, flanked by the newly appointed commander of the SS Panzerkorps Paul Hauser and the divisional commander Obergruppenführer Sepp Dietrich. They've noticed the colour of the Leibstandarte Stugs. They appear to be in a shade of sand brown specified for vehicles serving in North Africa suggesting that this may have been the original destination of these particular machines. The standard colour for vehicles serving in Europe and on the Russian front at this time was still dark grey, the order requiring all vehicles to adopt a base shade of sand yellow not being issued until February 1943. First combat footage of the Stug 3F came with a film of Assault Gun Battalion 203 driving into the outskirts of Rostov-on-Don 
At the end of July 1942, a fleeting glimpse can be obtained of the battalion insignia, a white elephant on the superstructure side of one of the passing stoogs. The onset of the second winter on the Eastern Front found the German army far more able and prepared to cope with the appalling conditions encountered there. Particular attention had been paid to the problem experienced by the panzers and assault guns the previous winter, when due to the high ground pressure produced by their narrow tracks, they found traction in the deep snow difficult and had frequently sank and grounded on their bellies. The solution came in the form of Ostketten, specially cast links that extended out beyond the road wheels increasing the width of the tracks and reducing the ground pressure, thus making for a smoother passage by the panzer, or in this case a salt gun, over the snow. Where possible, as in this footage, the Stoog still employed a road, but the addition of Ostketten permitted them to venture off-road into the deeper snow that would be found in the wood in which this action is taking place. The mobility conferred by Ostketten allowed the Stoogs and panzers to take on the wider track Soviet tanks on more equal terms. December 1942 saw the final model of the salt gun enter production. Although the hull remained the same as that on the F-8, the superstructure was redesigned with the commander receiving a cupola and the gunner's hatch a shield for use with a machine gun. The German war economy was undergoing dramatic expansion and 1943 was to see more than 3,000 Stugs leave the factory. With the Panzer Arm in dire straits, the high production and cheapness of the Stug led to it being seen as a substitute for the tank within the Panzer divisions. Small wonder that General Guderian had unsuccessfully attempted to wrest control of the assault gun battalions from the artillery, shortly after being appointed Inspector General of Panzer Troops, so as to incorporate them in the Panzer Waffe. Over 600 assault guns were assembled for Operation Citadel in July 1943. Most were employed in assault gun brigades. Yet another organisational change, albeit on paper this time, as the numbers of Stugs remained at 31. The Gross Deutschland Panzer Grenadier Division deployed its own slightly enlarged battalion with 35 Stugs, while the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Waffen SS Panzer Grenadier Divisions each deployed their own organic Stug battalions. This was by far the largest concentration of assault guns ever deployed for one operation. Many Stugs now wore shirts and 5mm thick steel skirts attached to the vehicle by rails and covering the flank of the machine. These had been introduced in March 1943 to provide extra protection from the Soviet 14.5mm anti-tank rifles. They functioned as a simple form of standoff armour and were designed to deflect incoming shells. By the time of Kursk, assault guns were wearing the three-colour camouflage paint scheme, sand yellow as a base coat, with olive green and red brown. Numerous extra spare road wheels were carried by Stugs and Panzers for this operation. The Germans were conscious that the Soviets had laid extensive minefields and assumed many of their armoured vehicles would need to replace mine-damaged road wheels whilst on the battlefield. Nevertheless, losses of Stugs to mines were higher than the Germans had anticipated. Successful assault gun commanders were fated as heroes in the German press. This is Hauptmann Franz, CEO of the Stug Battalion of the Gross Deutschland Division, after receiving his oak leaves to the Knight's Cross. Max Wuncher was a Hauptsturmführer with the Leibstandarte in 1941 and commanded the Divisional Stug Battalion. He rose to high rank in the 12th SS Panzer Division. But perhaps the finest assault gun commander of all was Hugo Primazik who became the first NCO in the German army to be awarded the Oak Leaves to the Knight's Cross for his exploits. In the wake of Hitler's abandonment of Operation Citadel, the Red Army launched a whole series of offensives along the southern front. Just prior to Operation Rumyantsev, their offensive to recapture Kharkov, the Soviets launched a major drive against the Mears line to draw off German forces. The Stug 3 F-8s in this sequence are serving with 6th Army on the Mears sector. A ferocious battle raged with the Germans first blunting the Soviets before launching their own counter-offensive in August, which retook the territory lost to the Russians since the 17th of July. These next two sequences allow us to view assault guns employed in the classic roles that characterised the type by this stage of the war. 
In the former, a number of Stug 3Gs move forward carrying Romanian infantry on their rear decks to attack a hill held by the Soviets. The infantry dismount and fan out while the Stugs offer fire support by employing high explosive shells to keep down the heads of the enemy. Here, the Stugs are executing the very task they were created for. In the second, we see assault guns being employed in the role that increasingly became the type's forte, that of tank destroyer. A group of Soviet tanks is seen approaching the German position. One is a captured panther which is knocked out and the Russian crew taken prisoner. The particular site employed by the Stug commander allowed him to range out to a maximum distance of 2,000 metres when employing armour-piercing shot and 1,500 metres when using the lighter AP-40 shell. The high muzzle velocity, flat trajectory 75mm Sturm Cannon 40, allied to the superior optics of the Stug, allowed a good crew to hit the target within the first few shots. The Stug's main armament was more than adequate to deal with the once deadly T-34-76 at long range, as seen here. When the Italian surrender was announced on the 8th of September, Hitler ordered the activation of Axis, the contingency plan for the occupation of Italy. Numerous military units travelled through the Brenner Pass into Italy, including this assault gun unit. The Stug was to play an important role in the German defence of the peninsula, the terrain of Italy proving more suitable for assault guns and self-propel guns than tanks. Indeed, the Germans maintained very few panzer divisions in the Italian theatre. Assault guns were also to play an important role in southern Italy when on the 9th of September 1943 the Allies landed at Salerno. Their expectation was that they would face little opposition and that Naples would be rapidly secured. While the landings did catch the Germans by surprise, their forces in the area, 10th Army under General von Wietinghoff, were far from negligible. However, only 16th Panzer Division, equipped with about 100 Panzers and 36 assault guns, was immediately to hand to counter the landings. These went into the attack on the 9th. Naval gunfire, Allied tanks and airstrikes all helped to grind down the attack and by the end of the day, 16th Panzer had lost much of its armour. Subsequently, the battle for Salerno was to become most intense before finally the Germans chose to cut their losses and withdraw. This Stug 3 F8 in Italy belongs to the Hermann Goering Panzer Division, which was refitting in the Salerno area after service in Tunisia and Sicily. Six months later, assault guns Model G's of the Hermann Goering Panzer Division were part of the German forces blockading the Anzio bridgehead. The four battles fought for Monte Cassino between January and May 1944 made the fighting for the rubble that was once the world-famous Benedictine Monastery some of the most vicious of the European campaign. For a greater part of the time, the summit was held by elite German paratroopers who had even managed to bring an assault gun with them to provide fire support in the face of frequent Allied attacks. The tactic of the Stug mirrors the employment of assault guns all over Italy. Lurking under cover in a bombed-out house, the Stug emerges to support the paratroops in a localised counter-attack. Unable to use its mobility to any real degree because of the debris, it employs its tracks to turn on the spot and bring its gun to bear where needed. However, Allied artillery spotters in the ruins could call down artillery fire very quickly, and so having fired its gun, it would retreat back under cover and wait for its next assignment. For the paratroops, the presence of the assault gun was no doubt a vital help in their defence of the summit. By 1944, the assault gun was one of the most common German armoured fighting vehicles being employed in every theatre in which German troops were fighting. In this sequence, Stugs are being employed as artillery in an anti-guerrilla sweep in Yugoslavia. As the late summer turned to autumn and then winter in southern Russia, the German army began its fighting retreat to the river Dnieper. In common with other German armoured units, the assault detachments continued to offer fierce resistance to the advancing forces of the Red Army. Although losses at Kursk had been high, the stock of assault guns in the period August through to December continued to show a deficit of production over losses. 
So in the five months to December, the output of Stubbs had amounted to 1,810 machines, with 1,060 machines being lost over the same period. At the beginning of December 1943, total stock of Stugs in all theatres amounted to 1,880 machines, some 400 more than available at the beginning of July and immediately prior to Operation Citadel. The reality was that by this period of the war, the Stug III was the most numerous of all types of armoured vehicle serving in the German army. By the end of 1943, there were a total of 31 assault gun brigades in service, the bulk being in the east, as well as independent Stug detachments held at core level and allocated according to need, as well as organic battalions in certain army and Waffen-SS divisions. With the onset of 1944, no fewer than 76% of all assault guns in service were operating on the eastern front. The increasing employment of the assault artillery as tank destroyers is very clearly shown in this sequence, wherein a Stug detachment within Army Group Center rolls forward to counterattack an oncoming Soviet armored group. The action is rendered more dramatic by the backdrop, a very cold late winter afternoon with the sun already beginning to wane. The snow lies thin on the rock-hard ground, which allows the Stugs easy purchase for their tracks as they move forward. Although appearing to be moving at random, the machines are under close guidance from the command stu. The enemy is engaged at some distance, the flat terrain making targeting easier. However, the Stugs do not fire on the move. They stop, fire a number of rounds, then change position to prevent the enemy gaining a fix. The consequences of their handiwork is the destroyed T-34-76 model 1943 and a rarely seen KV-85. By the late summer of 1944, the Red Army had pushed the German forces back to the borders of Hungary. The propaganda company have here caught a Stug detachment moving through Budapest on its way to the front. On the stopover, the crews are surrounded by a number of admiring youngsters belonging to the Hungarian fascist youth organization. In the subsequent fighting on the Hungarian plain, assault gun units were heavily engaged against Soviet armor, while also being employed to give fire support to local infantry counterattacks by Hungarian and German troops. When the long-expected Allied landings in France took place on June the 6th, 1944, the authorities in Germany reported a remarkable surge of expectation on the part of the populace many Germans sincerely believing that the only outcome would be a German victory. The key to the German plans to defeat the Allied landings were the armoured formations. Atypically, for this period of the war, there were far more panzers present in France than assault guns and self-propelled guns. The total number of panzers on strength on June the 1st amounted to 1140 machines, whereas there were just 393 assault guns and other self-propelled weapons. Although two assault gun brigades were stationed in France, the bulk of those encountered by the Allies were in service with the tank destroyer battalions of Panzer Divisions, SS Panzer Regiments, and the Stu battalions of the 1st and 2nd SS Panzer Divisions. Seen for the first time on camera is an example of the Stug IV, a Panzer IV chasse mated to the superstructure of the Stug III in service with the 17th SS Panzer Grenadier Division, which entered the line on the 12th of June. The Stug IV entered production in December 1943, with just over 1,100 being produced. Of particular note on the Stug IVs and threes in this footage is the Salkoff blender, a new pig's head-shaped cast mantlet fitted to all assault guns from February 1944 onwards. The very heavy fighting among the narrow lanes lined on either side with dense hedgerows provided the very worst of combat conditions for the assault guns. Room for manoeuvre was slight, placing a weapon with a fixed gun had a grave disadvantage. Here the fighting was often at close quarters and many a Stug fell victim to a bazooka rocket fired from the hedges. Nevertheless, assault guns did take a toll of Allied armour, the Sherman proving as vulnerable to its 75mm gun as the T-34. Nemesis for the assault guns in Normandy came in the same winged form as for the Panzers. The rockets of the British Typhoon found the armour of the Stugs no more problematic than that of the Panzer IV, Panther or Tiger. 
Assault guns could only venture out from cover when skies were clear, and even then their machines had to be liberally covered with foliage, allowing the crew to rapidly drive their Stug off the road when the dreaded Yebos appeared and meld if possible into the hedgerows. Movement in daytime was extremely hazardous for German armoured vehicles, in spite of the large flak umbrella provided. Although large numbers of Allied aircraft were down, the firepower of the mass 20mm, 37mm and 88mm flak batteries were never enough to compensate for the total air supremacy enjoyed by the Allies and the impotence of the Luftwaffe to intervene. For protection, many Stug crews dug a hole in the ground and then employed their 23-ton charges as shelters by parking them over the cavity. Even at the height of the fighting, assault gun crewmen who distinguish themselves in action are awarded the Iron Cross by their commander. Shown at the same time is assault gun commander Oberleutnant Franz Ludwig, who was awarded the Knight's Cross in Normandy for the destruction of 16 British tanks. By August, the strain of battle and the knowledge that events were not moving in Germany's favour can be seen etched in the pale and fatigued expressions of the infantry. German losses in equipment were steadily increasing, with no prospect of replacement, while those of the Allies were replenished from seemingly inexhaustible reserves. With the American breakout from the Cherbourg Peninsula and the British drive south towards Falaise in full flood, the surviving assault gun units were embroiled in savage fighting as the Germans tried to prevent the encirclement of Army Group West. Here, a number of Zimmerit-covered Stug 3s are cooperating with a number of Marder 3 self-propelled guns and have succeeded in brewing up a British Achilles tank destroyer. Very few assault guns survived the closing of the Falaise pocket. This late model Stug 4 is covered with Zimmerit anti-magnetic mine paste on all of its vertical surfaces, as is this late Stug 3 equipped with the Salkoff blend. A catastrophic explosion has blown its roof off. This Sturmhaubitzer 42 did make it, only to be abandoned later by its crew as the same bridges were down. There is a very large hole in the newsreel coverage of the fighting on the Eastern Front that equates to the period of the Soviet summer offensive. The subsequent destruction of Army Group Center and loss of half a million dead and captured soldiers translated into the greatest defeat ever to befall German arms. When the newsreel once more began to report on events in the East, German units such as this Stug detachment are operating on the borders of Poland. Footage of assault gun units in action on the Eastern Front from the period early autumn 1944 through to the end of the war increases substantially relative to that of panzers filmed in this same period. In nearly all cases, Stug units are shown employed in the tank destroyer role, operating in conjunction with anti-tank guns and 88mm flat guns as they take on Soviet armour. Notwithstanding the heavy losses during 1944, assault gun production of both Stug 3s and 4s reached a peak of just under 5,000 being built. In July 1944, total stocks of assault guns were some 2,000 higher than in the same month for 1943. That the assault gun brigades and other Stug units continue to be highly effective is mirrored in the continuing high toll they were taking of Soviet armor. 20,000 Soviet tanks destroyed by Stugs were claimed up to mid-1944. By war's end, this figure had risen by another 10,000. There is little doubt that the Red Army viewed these units with a great deal of respect. On August 1, 1944, General Bor Komorowski, commander of the Polish Home Army, gave the order for the Warsaw Uprising. Within four days, the Poles had seized four-fifths of the city. 
Expectations that they would be relieved by the Soviets were dashed when the Germans drove back their spearheads, giving them the breathing space they needed to suppress the uprising. German retribution was ferocious, detached stood units providing fire support in the clearing of the city. It took until October the 2nd for the uprising to be finally put down. By the beginning of September 1944, the Soviet offensive drives had come to a halt, allowing the Germans to create the semblance of a front in eastern Poland and East Prussia. German losses in men and material had been colossal. While the newsreels conveyed the impression of the steady and relentless flow of supplies and equipment eastward to the front, what they did not communicate was the deteriorating situation in the supply of fuel that was to have a significant impact on the scope of German mobile operations. This in spite of the still high output of equipment from the armaments factories in Germany itself. Under a barrage provided by Vespa self-propelled guns, an assault gun detachment moves against Soviet positions in Lithuania. At least one of the assault guns seen in the footage is a late Model G with sour pop blender and a thick application of concrete applied to the front and side of the superstructure. The other Stugs are earlier models and all have a liberal application of Zimmerit anti-magnetic mine paste. While such local counter-attacks were filmed right up towards end, always concluding on the faces of smiling soldiers, they could have no impact on the wider strategic picture of terminal German military decline. Unlike in the West, the scale of operations on the Eastern Front precluded the Soviet Air Force achieving the same degree of air superiority. German mobile forces were thus able to move about with a degree of freedom from attack unknown in the West, this being mirrored in the little or no foliage carried by many German vehicles. Under such conditions, Luftwaffe Schlachtflieger could provide ground support. One of the most effective types was the Henschel HS-129B. Operating in swarms of four aircraft, the HS-129s would use their armament of two machine guns and two 20mm cannons and add on armament packages to attack Soviet armor. The ultimate expression of the 129 as a flying tank destroyer was the B-3 model, which saw service in late 1944, early 45, which employed a 75mm anti-tank gun slung under its belly. Tank hunting assault gun fashion did not always mean engagements at long range. In this case, Stug 3s crewed by paratroops advanced towards known Soviet positions, carrying small groups of infantry equipped for close combat with tanks. Their weapons are the formidable one-shot Panzerfaust and 88mm Panzerschreck. The assault guns close on a wood from which emerge Soviet tanks, the first being a T-34-76, which is destroyed by the Stugs fairly promptly. The second T-34-76 is then taken out by a soldier employing a Panzerschreck. Of note is the very considerable backblast of this weapon which made the position of its operative a giveaway, thus requiring a rapid move once he'd fired. The power of the 88mm projectile was such that it was able to penetrate the armour of any Soviet or Allied tank, including the IS-2. The Soviet tank on fire is a later T-3485, which has actually been destroyed by the Stugs rather than by the infantry weapons.
This Stug detachment operating in East Prussia in the autumn of 1944 is clearly aware of the possibility of Soviet air attack, having taken steps to deck their vehicles out with foliage. The operation would seem to be a limited one of retaking a village that has fallen into Soviet hands. Many of the Stugs are late models with a sow's head mantlet and steel return rollers. All, however, are festooned with the tackle and clutter that assault gun crews stored on their rear decks and retained in place by improvised metalwork welded on in the field. This seeming lack of any sign of the enemy gives the impression of a reconstruction for the benefit of the propaganda film team. The Germans were no more averse to this sleight of hand when it came to putting footage together than Allied film crews. Both were engaged in the same activity. German infantry move out to attack Soviet positions under a barrage provided by 88mm Pac-43 anti-tank guns firing as artillery. Footage of the Stug 4 in action is quite rare. In this sequence, a Stug 4 detachment is seen counter-attacking Soviet forces in Hungary in late 44. The design was a contingency resulting from Hitler's demand that production of the assault gun which had been lost when the Orchid factory in Berlin was bombed in December 43, be replaced by grafting the superstructure of the Stug III onto the chassis of the Panzer IV. The Stug IV was issued to assault artillery units in the same manner as the III and employed exactly the same tactics. Hitler retained strong armoured forces in Hungary to contest the Soviet advance there, even at the expense of his forces in Poland. Numerous Stug units were in action and footage from that front allows us to see many of the features to be found on the late Model Gs, leaving the factories from March, April 1944 onward. Apart from the occasional Stug III seen with concrete added to its frontage, the most significant change is the addition of a remote-controlled machine gun to the roof of the vehicle in place of the former shield used with the MG-34 or 42. This allowed the gunner to fire the machine gun, now permanently fixed to the roof of the Stug, from within the machine without exposing his person. Although this was a feature more frequently seen on Stug 3s and the 4 with the sow's head mantlet, it is also seen in this footage fitted to Stug 3s with the earlier mantlet. By this period, Stug units were having to contend with more powerful Soviet armor than the earlier T-34-76. Most commonly encountered was the T-34 mounting a new turret with a powerful 85mm gun, as well as the heavily armored IS-2 Stalin tank. While the latter was problematic for assault guns, tactics were developed that enabled the German machine to successfully defeat this very powerful Soviet tank. Two weeks of October 1944, the Soviet First Baltic Front succeeded in driving to the Baltic coast, thereby isolating the remnants of Army Group North in the Kurland Peninsula. Hitler refused to evacuate the whole position by sea, believing that the 26 German divisions bottled up there played an important role in tying down Soviet forces that could have been employed elsewhere. He did permit a limited evacuation, which led to more than a million and a half German troops and civilians being evacuated between January and May 1945 in Kurland, Prussia and Pomerania. Guderian, who was by this time chief of the general staff, believed it to have been strategic madness to have so many German troops isolated when their presence could do much to help strengthen German forces in eastern Poland and subsequently on the Oder in 1945. It was fortunate for the Germans that the Soviet Baltic fleet was inoperable and the Kriegsmarine were able to maintain control of the sea off Kurland and East Prussia. While many of these soldiers were fortunate to have escaped from Kurland, 
many were consumed in the ferocious fighting as the Red Army resumed its advance westward in January 1945. In spite of its isolation, footage of the fighting in Kurland still reached Germany. Although Soviet forces launched a large number of attacks on the position, it would seem that beyond a certain point they regarded the German forces there as being militarily of little consequence. Cut off as they were from the main front, the German forces in Kurland had thus to fight off Soviet forces on the defence perimeter with declining assets. Units were stretched thinly and counter-attacks on Soviet positions, such as that seen in this footage carried out by a small Stug 3 detachment and supporting infantry, were at best riposts. The resources were simply not available for it to be any other than a very local counter-attack. These forces continued to decline until war's end and the surrender of the remnants of the German forces left in Kurland in May 1945. By late October 1944, heavy fighting was taking place on the western borders of Germany. Assault guns carrying infantry are seen counter-attacking forces of the US Third Army in the Tsar. The heavy camouflage netting and foliage on these machines is testimony to the crew's respect and fear of the dreaded Yebos. The Stugs are operating with Panther medium tanks. When fire is opened on the US forces, most of the armored vehicles do so from under the cover of woods. Under such conditions, both Stugs and Panthers are best able to employ their longer-ranging guns over those of the American Sherman tank. Panther im Gefecht auf einer Dorfstraße. An artillery observer then ranges in on the American positions and a battery of 105 mm howitzers opens fire. Die Landschaft ist vom Rauch der Explosionen und Brände durchzogen. the barrage and using the smoke as cover, infantry make their way forward towards the American positions. They're equipped with a variety of weapons, including the Panzerfaust one-shot anti-tank weapon. The Shermans and half-tracks would seem to have been brewed up by long-range gunfire from the assault guns and panthers. At least two of the M4s have suffered internal fires, the intensity of which has burnt off much of their paint and reduced the rubber on the road wheels to ash. By ruthless husbanding of his resources, Hitler was able to find 1,200 panzers and assault guns for the 5th and 6th SS panzer armies as the cutting edge of Operation Autumn Mist, his abortive Ardennes offensive. When launched on the 16th of December, the Allies were taken completely by surprise. The Germans initially succeeded in making rapid progress against units of the US 1st Army. The most westerly advance was made by armoured units of Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army which by the 20th was thrusting for Dinant on the Meurs crossings. But the town of Bastogne, in the rear of Manteuffel's columns, could not be taken, with a major impact on the German advance, which by the 23rd had stalled. On the 26th, the US 3rd Army, counterattacking from the south, relieved Bastogne, and the low cloud which had grounded Allied air power for nearly 10 days cleared. British and US aircraft now launched withering strikes on the naked German armoured columns, with the consequent destruction of many tanks and assault guns. By mid-January, the surviving German forces had pulled back to their start lines. Some 600 panzers and assault guns had been lost. A second German offensive, codenamed Operation Nordwind, opened in Alsace on New Year's Eve 1944. The objective was to trap seven divisions of the US 6th Army and recapture the city of Strasbourg. 
Unlike in the Ardennes, Allied intelligence was able to forewarn the American commander concerning the imminence of the German attack. The salt gun units were involved in the very heavy and bitter fighting, but within three days of the start of Nordwind, it had been brought to a halt. The German losses amounted to some 25,000 men and even further losses of panzers and assault guns. For the German forces in eastern Poland, the launch of the Soviet offensive from the Baranov bridgehead fell like a thunderbolt. A German war correspondent reported, the Soviets have poured masses of men, arms and material into the winter battle between the Carpathians and Mamel on a scale unparalleled in the more than five years of military action preceding the present offensive. Infantry divisions and armoured corps are erupting from the Vistula in numbers, which it has been so far impossible to count. As Guderian had predicted, the German position in Poland collapsed like a house of cards. And by mid-February, the Russians had reached the River Oder. Assault gun losses in January on both fronts totaled 320 machines. 210 left the factories in February in spite of the efforts of Allied bombing. And strength returns indicated that total stocks of Stug 3s and 4s in that month amounted to 3,610 machines, making the assault gun the most numerous German armoured fighting vehicle in service. The dire German manpower situation in the second half of 1944 forced the issue of a proclamation in October calling to arms all able-bodied males between 16 and 60 as part of the Volkssturm or People's Guard. In some of the last footage of the war taken by the propaganda company, large numbers of Volkssturm are seen marching through the streets of Breslau, one of the towns on the Oder designated by Hitler as a fortress city and taken before it was encircled on February the 14th, 1945. Weapons deliveries include numbers of the Goliath Remote Control Demolition Vehicle, which had demonstrated to Volkssturm troops just prior to their employment against the advancing Soviets. Dressed in a fashion that made them appear very similar to their enemies, these poorly trained civilians in uniform of distinctly dubious military value were led out to fight against overwhelming Soviet forces. Inside the flow of human resources came the material reinforcements for the regular army. Aboard the trains coming from the west, it is possible to identify, apart from the lorries, soft skins and heavy cars, a solitary King Tiger and a number of Jagdpanzer 470s. Assault guns belonging to a Waffen SS Panzer Division arrived with their supporting vehicles, including late model 251 armoured personnel half tracks. The Waffen-SS troopers that dismount from the lorries are liberally equipped with Panzerfaust and Panzerschreck anti-tank weapons, although their personal weapons show a remarkable range of types and age. As they move forward to the battle line, they are joined by a detachment of assault guns. In the subsequent combat, the Stugs are given covering fire by medium and heavy artillery as they move forward to blunt an attack by oncoming Soviet armor, which is approaching the German positions along the railway line. Having taken sight of the enemy armor, the Stugs open fire, registering a number of kills. MG-42 team provides covering fire for infantry as they move forward to examine the wrecks of the Soviet tanks. Two T-34 85s lay shattered by the 75mm cannons of the assault guns, while further along the track two Lend-Lease M4A2 Shermans lie destroyed. The attack rolls on as the Stugs are joined by a number of Panther tanks. In this last film ever taken of assault guns in action, we see these machines engaged in the role that had increasingly become their forte, that of tank destroyer. Although the notion of a turretless armoured fighting vehicle may have been viewed with askance by some pundits, a claimed 30,000 Soviet tanks destroyed in action over four years suggests that the concept of the assault gun was anything but a failure.